Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You may be seated. Well, this morning we are going to look at our gospel reading, and in our gospel reading we see two opposing forces. Uh, We see one where Jesus is giving a warning about the scribes and their arrogance, and and two, he's given an example of what it looks like to live out of our emptiness, out of humility, out of our weakness with uh, the widow who presents an offering. Now, if we look at the scribes, uh, just a little background information. Scribes, in general, were sought after people. They were often Jewish leaders. They didn't have to be Jewish leaders, but they often were Jewish leaders. They are, in this case, they could read and write, which was a big advantage when you're in a society when everyone can't read or write. So they were used in military operation. They were used in leadership roles. They were used in accounting. They were used in politics to read and to write. And they were looked at as uh, people would put them on a pedestal. And so we see Jesus describing the scribes. And he describes us, and he gives us a warning to not be like the scribes. He says, you know, they wear long robes. Ironically, I am wearing a long robe, but we don't have to... (laughs) Not the same robe. They wear long robes. Uh, They gain value from appearances. Uh, They get the best seats in the house. Uh, They take advantage of widows and their vulnerability. They love to pray with long prayers so that they would be heard by those around them. And you kind of get the idea, right? They they like to make a name for themselves. They like to put themselves on a pedestal. Now, Can you think of where you maybe look at the elite today and think, you know, if I only had that, I would be in good shape? I did it about two weeks ago when they had the billion-dollar lottery out there. I said, you know, if I had that billion-dollar lottery, I know that they say that people kind of ruin their lives, but I'm willing to give it a shot there. (laughs) But, But what are the places, you know, maybe for me it's, if I could preach like that, pastor maybe it's well if i had you know if i had that wife life would be better if i had that husband life would be better you know what are the things that we look at and say if i only had this life would be better i mean i know i've done this i know i do this it's a battle i think it's a constant battle it's our human nature to want to do this tim keller Uh, a pastor in New York who I've quoted a lot gives a story of a girl coming to him um, about her depression and she said every and, and it turned out that every morning when she got up she would step on the scale and depending on what the scale said would depend on whether her day went well or not now there's nothing wrong with wanting to be healthy I think that's a good thing. The Lord says the body is our temple. But it's another thing for that to, for a good thing to be an ultimate thing. That was the root of her life. You know, if I could just have this. You know, we we make good things, as Tim Keller says, ultimate things. And so that's what's happening with these scribes. It's, It's a good thing that they're making an ultimate thing. And Jesus is giving a warning about that. So Jesus sits down, and he sees something. He sees uh, all of these folks who are wealthy giving money, and then he sees a widow come in, and she drops two copper coins in there, equal about a penny. And he sits down, and he calls his disciples over, and he says, will you look at that? And what does he say? He says, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box, for they all contribute out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. You know, I don't think this is about money. I think it's more about faith than it is about money, this passage. It's about living out of our weakness living out of our brokenness, living out of our 
emptiness instead of our abundance. So what keeps us from living out of our hearts or out of our weakness or out of who we really, really are? What keeps us from doing that? Well, I think there's a number of things, but I'm just going to talk about one thing. Uh, I'm just going to give you one, and that's fear. I think that fear is one of the things that keep us from living out of our emptiness, out of our brokenness, out of our weakness, because we all have it. I mean, we don't have to raise hands in here to know that we all have weakness. That's just human nature. We're, 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 we're fallen human beings. We have weakness. It's not a, it's not a, uh, a, we don't have to beat ourselves up over it. It's just human nature. So what are some fears? Fear of rejection, fear of failure. Will I ever find love? Will the depression or anxiety ever go away? Will this addiction ever be broken? Am I enough? These are all, you know, you can, you can name whatever the fear is. You, you know it. But see, the, the good news is that our fear, our stuff, does not phase Christ. And I believe when, when you begin to be honest about yourself, when we begin to be honest about ourselves and we can start living like this widow, where although it may look like weakness, but Jesus considers it strength. Dan Allender, I've been reading a book called, it's a great book, it's called Leading with a Limp. It's by a guy named Dan Allender. He's a, he's a Christian, he's a psychologist, he's a professor out in Washington State. And he, uh, in this book, he's talking about fear and uh, weakness and he's talking about living out of it and he says what happens when we begin to name our cowardice and admit our inclination to hide what happens well paradoxically when we muster the courage to name our fears we gain greater confidence and far greater trust from others still confronting our fears involves risk in certain environments any honesty about one's failures can be the kiss of death so if you love truth and are bound to its proclamation, flee the cults of pretense and of Christian artifice. Seek out a new context in which to lead. If you find a church or organization that is not bound to pretense but might simply be ill-equipped to admit what the Scriptures teach about our struggle with sin, you will be in a place where honesty has the greatest potential to alter the culture of latent deceit. So what is he saying in that? He's saying that a, that, an, uh, that a culture of being honest about who we really are, uh, a culture that doesn't try to pretend that because we're Christians we have it all together, we might begin to have a culture, we might have a culture in here that is a light to the world. I mean, I don't know about you, but I want this to be a place where we can be honest about our own hearts, where we can be honest about where we struggle, where we can be honest about things that uh, go on in our lives. You know, Jesus doesn't say, come to me, all you who have it together. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's good news. You see, this kind of weakness, it's actually strength because this kind of weakness requires us to say, Jesus, I need you. So what is the fuel, or I should say the security, to live like this, to live a life like this? Well, I think the first thing is, is we have to admit the truth. Uh, I think we have to admit our own arrogance, our own narcissism, our own holding ourselves above others, admitting our struggles too. See, if it's depression or anxiety or addiction, whatever it is. Galatians 3 says, For anyone who thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. You know? And, and I have to, you have to admit 
that because of those things, I believe we have to admit, and because of those things, it means that we deserved or deserve the greater condemnation. And like at the end of verse 40, where Jesus is talking about these scribes. But as is God's mercy, we also have to remember even greater that this condemnation was satisfied. I mean, who really received the greater condemnation? Instead of me, instead of you. Well, it was Jesus. And now he says, this is my paraphrase. I mean, you know when you try to be something you're not? And you fell out, well, I love you. You know when you blow up and get angry and you say to yourself, I've done it again. Then Romans 8, 1 is true for you. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Well, the gospel's called good news. Now we can live with a new freedom to live with a heart like the widow where your weakness is not a detriment but it is a gift to others. When I was working at the VA in Pittsburgh um, and we would go into veterans' rooms, I worked with a team of uh, palliative care and hospice uh, doctors and psychologists and nurses and we would go into a a a um a veteran's room and the veteran would talk to the doctor but before the veteran but uh the veteran would always be more vulnerable with me as the chaplain but you know who they would be more vulnerable with than the chaplain other veterans because they had that bond that same struggle. You know, I can, I can counsel someone that has dealt with PTSD, but I've never been on the battlefield. But these other veterans who, who, who had dealt with PTSD would come in and they would meet with these veterans. And man, it was a, it was a beautiful thing to see how healing can occur like that. That's what happens when we start to share our weakness with one another. Whether it's you're a veteran or whether it's some other weakness, whether it's grief, being in a grief group with someone, is, is that you've got a power that the Lord uses that in your weakness, that sharing uh, your struggles with other people, it gives them healing to remind them that they're not alone that you're in the battle together, and that there is a power in Jesus that rescues, that rescues your bo you both. Lauren Daigle, uh, who is a Christian artist, she's got a lot of press lately because of, uh, she's been on the Jimmy Fallon show, and she's been on Ellen, and she's, you know, she's this Christian singing in these secular venues. And she has this beautiful song called uh, you say, and I'm just going to give you a couple of the lyrics here as we finish up. It says, I keep fighting voices in my mind that say I'm not enough. Every single lie that tells me I will never measure up. Am I more than just the sum of every high and every low? Remind me once again just who I am because I need to know. You say I am loved when I can't feel a thing. You say I'm strong when I think I am weak. You say I am held when I am falling short. When I don't belong, you say that I am yours. Friends, you are His. That's where the good news of the gospel is. That's what allows you to admit where you are. Because you are His. 
It says, taking all I have, and now I'm laying it at your feet. You have every failure, God, and you'll have every victory. And that's what we're going to do. That's what we do every week at the Lord's Supper. That's why we have it every week, is we lay it down at his feet. We come and we say, you know, this is what my head says. This is what my heart's trying to tell me. This is what the world says. But you say something different, Lord. And I'm going to kneel before you, and I'm going to receive that. So receive it. It's good news. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit.